Brothers and friends, we are going to go ahead and proceed without our guest speaker this evening. We are uh, fortunate enough. We did have a couple people reach out, and I appreciate your generosity of willing to give a presentation in a pinch. Uh, this is a good learning experience for us. We've done, I believe, 33 online video presentations and have not dealt with this situation yet. So let's hope and pray that this is not a, um, uh, a year to come um, routine. But our brother, worship brother John Sissel, who is set to present next week, has written a paper, and he has graciously said that he will uh, offer the time this evening to present on his paper. Uh, he just says, whatever you do, don't give him a hard time if it's not as polished as you would like it to be, but let's give him a hard time anyway, because we have to give somebody a hard time tonight. Um, you're more than welcome to give me a hard time, too. I can take it. So let's go ahead and begin. With that being said, Worship Brother Bizak, when we get to you, would you please be so kind as to have the bio prepared for uh, Worship Brother Sissel to present uh, during that introduction period. So brothers and friends, we are well into 2022. We're gathering together yet again for another year in another episode of Quality Virtual Masonic Education. This episode marks our 13th education in a series entitled 21st Century Conversations on Freemasonry. Having barely scratched the surface of possible authors presenting and willing to share their Masonic knowledge with us, Rubicon has decided to continue with this same theme for another year as we each seek to better understand ourselves and achieve further light in Masonry. On behalf of everyone at Rubicon, we sincerely hope that your new year is off to a great start. For those of you who are returning visitors to our education, we thank you for coming back this evening. And for those of you who are new, we welcome you and we thank you for being with us tonight. First, as usual, I would like to recognize briefly uh, the, the participating sponsors whom without your support and the brothers therein, this virtual education would not be possible, nor would it be as enjoyable. Uh, the Rubicon Masonic Society is an invitation only private group of Master Mason Freemasons located in Lexington, Kentucky. William O'Ware Lodge of Research is chartered in 1965 and is Kentucky's oldest research lodge. And Lexington Lodge Number no. 1 was chartered in 1788, and it is the oldest Masonic Lodge in Kentucky. Alongside my good friends, Worship Brother Dan Kimball, Tom Nitschke, John Bizak, my name is Brian Evans. I'm the past master of Lexington Lodge Number no. 1 and chairman, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get this show started. Thank you again for being with us. Worship Brother Dan Kimball, would you please be so kind, brother, to deliver an opening devotion to our guests? Thank you, Worshipful Brother Brian. Our invocation this evening comes from ritual from the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin. Brothers, join me in prayer. We ask your grace and wisdom, O Lord, as we meet together. Lead and guide us all. Prepare our hearts and minds to hear and receive. Grant us clear minds to perceive the reflections of your wisdom and counsel, and help us to maintain the harmony, which is so vital to our fellowship. Giving this time to you and your service, we thank you for your grace. Amen. So much. Thank you, worship brother. Brothers and friends, the purpose of our virtual Masonic education is to gather together and to assist in the improvement of oneself by establishing a deeper understanding and connection with Freemasonry, with its traditions and practices, and further cementing our brotherhood for the fraternity of the fraternity for the betterment of mankind. As, an, as a disclaimer, any opinions expressed during this virtual education will be those of the presenter or participant. They do not necessarily reflect the views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. By participating with us this evening, you consent to our guidelines and our full disclosure can be read at rubiconmasoniccsociety.com slash disclosure. As you know, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are welcome to attend and are encouraged to participate. So please everyone be mindful that anything discussed this evening should always be suitable for Masons of all degrees as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected at all times. We request, we request no alcohol, smoking food or foul language. There will also be no discussion of politics or religion at any time and attendees may be asked to leave if not following the protocols. And briefly, just some recommendations to help ensure that our evening goes as enjoyable as possible. The recommended attire for each meeting is coat and tie. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title or location under your identity, under your, under your picture to identify yourself to others. If you're not a Mason, that's no problem. Please simply type guest after your name so we know. 
Please enable your video camera so other attendees can see you. Please reduce any background noise. Keep your microphone muted when not speaking and turn off all other computer programs to eliminate outside. <laughs> and finally, as you have already demonstrated very well, please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Tonight's presenter was supposed to be next month's presenter and due to the nature of the circumstances prior to this evening, we were not able to update the slides accordingly. Therefore, we will be hearing a presentation from worship brother John Sissel on the topic of reconsidering our approach, groupthink and Freemasonry. Worship brother Bizak, would you please be so kind as to deliver the introduction to our worship brother? Yes, uh, John Sissel is a fourth generation Freemason. He's currently the master of Butchel Lodge, 896 in Louisville, Kentucky. He was appointed Grand Junior Deacon in 2018 through 19, and he served on several committees, including Education, Sonic Mission Advancement, and Chairman of the Bylaws Committee for the Grand Lodge. And he's a present past president of the Greater Louisville Masonic Education Association. He's made presentations at numerous local lodges at district meetings and was invited to present at the 2019 Masonic Restoration foundation symposium held here in Lexington. He has a bachelor of science in business administration and runs a successful mortgage lending team. John has a reputation as a solid thinking Mason. And I've referred to him before as a soldier of reason. And we're always pleased to have him with us tonight. And he is a member of the Rubicon Masonic Society. Brother John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brother John. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Beautiful. Well, brothers, this evening's presentation is reconsidering our approach, group think in Freemasonry. Freemasonry is a voluntary association of men with various social or economic backgrounds, professional lives, and education levels. And one of the truths of our gentle craft is that all men meet on a common level within the confines of the Masonic Lodge. A common level, however, does not prevent each man from bringing his own unique life experiences into the lodge room with him and letting those influence the role he plays within the lodge. Would you rather your treasury be managed by a CPA or a delivery driver? And while Brother Delivery Driver is certainly well-intentioned and diligent in his duties as treasurer, I believe we would all agree that professional training of our Brother CPA equips him with a certain set of tools it might make him better suited for this particular task. An organization that's made up of volunteer leaders with few or no professional managers naturally has a challenge in the administration of that organization's professional affairs. Much of the success of these volunteer organizations can be attributed to the method by which they groom, train, and choose new leaders. For much of American Freemasonry's history, before the burgeoning rosters of our 20th century anyway, local lodges were filled with men across the socioeconomic spectrum. In these lodges, you might find the local bank president second, sitting next to the town blacksmith. Each of these brothers could bring then their unique skill set into the roles that they filled within the lodge. Now the changing landscape of the mid 20th century brought about significantly larger lodges, with brothers who were on average less engaged in the administration of that lodge business. And a result, the power structure in the lodge became more vertical than in the previous 18th and 19th centuries. One of the consequences then of the decrease in membership over the last 60 years is that there are fewer men to carry out the leadership roles within our lodges and consequently our grand lodges. Now, the popular perception of the desirability of membership in Freemasonry has decreased corresponding to its membership counts, and we are therefore seeing fewer quote unquote community leaders joining the fraternity. Those who do in fact join are oftentimes handling complex schedules that limit their participation in business meetings. And in many cases, Freemasonry has therefore become a place where men of limited personal success are allowed to become leaders with significant power and influence. These men who have limited or are completely without professional experience in the administration of large organizations, budgets, and business strategies are then handed the reins of power. Now, they quickly find themselves ill-equipped to perform the task at hand and are only there because their schedules allowed them to attend the most meetings each week. 
This leadership selection process ignores typical qualifications, which are rooted in training, experience, and proven outcomes. Leadership experience is oftentimes the result of applying management theory learned and then honed by progressive levels of responsibility. The path to experienced leadership can take many forms, including a formal study in a classroom environment, practical training in military or other structured settings, and self-study from the thousands of sources of management theory and psychological materials available to each of us. Universities across the country offer a wide variety of professional management training, but you don't have to be a graduate of the Wharton School to study groupthink. Groupthink, my brothers, can be defined as, quote, the practice of thinking or making decisions as a group in a way that discourages creativity or individual responsibility, end quote, and is characterized by eight symptoms. These are then subdivided into three groups. So the first group is overestimation of a group's power and morality. And the symptoms of this are the illusion of invulnerability and the belief in the inherent morality of the group. The second group is called closed-mindedness. Those characteristics are collective rationalization, out-group stereotypes. And the third group is pressure towards uniformity, consisting of self-censorship, the illusion of unanimity, direct pressure on dissenters, and finally, self-appointed mind guards. Groupthink has the effect of preventing contradictory views from being expressed and subsequently evaluated. Higher quality outcomes are precluded because of a perceived need for conformity. Irving Janis, who is the pioneer of the initial research on groupthink said, and I quote, the more amiability and esprit de corps there is among the members of a policy making in group, the greater the danger that independent critical thinking will be replaced by groupthink which is likely to result in irrational and dehumanizing actions directed against outgroups, end quote. Brothers, there are countless examples of the eight symptoms of groupthink in Freemasonry. For this evening, I'd like to narrow our focus in the interest of time to those symptoms that are, in my opinion at least, most prevalent and in the greatest need of modification. The first is the illusion of invulnerability. Brothers, this is so systematically entrenched in today's Masonic culture that to contradict it is near heresy. We're the oldest, most noble fraternal organization in the world, having existed since time immemorial, right? We exist to take good men and make them better. And we are the fount from which all of our great nation has leapt forth, right? Our group stereotyping is an act of actively or passively labeling those group members who are not supportive of a popular opinion in a negative manner. Surely you've never heard someone refer with disdain to, quote, one of those Masons. And the third symptom is direct pressure on dissenters. This occurs when members of, who question the group are faced with questions of their own loyalty. Have you ever stopped to wonder about that younger brother who was enthusiastic to the point of being boisterous, who had a never-ending stream of ideas to energize a lodge, and who, after a while, faded completely from view. Have you ever watched your Grand Lodge ostracize a brother who had strong opinions that just didn't quite conform to the party line? Ideally, it's a benefit to build a consensus in the decision-making process, and we can all agree that consensus strengthens the execution of a well-structured plan, right? See what I did there? I led you to the thought. But a consensus doesn't inherently help in the execution of any plan. It can allow for a large group to make decisions to complete tasks and to finish a project quickly and efficiently. <clears throat> the downside that we have with groupthink is that creative thought and individual opinions are suppressed. This increases the likelihood of a poor decision and inefficient problem solving. According to the psychology consultant and educator Kendra Cherry, quote, a number of factors can influence this psychological phenomenon. It tends to occur more in situations where group members are very similar to one another, end quote, and, quoting again, situations where the group is placed under extreme stress, end quote. 
it's important for any group that has to make decisions, especially decisions that allocated limited resources, to make the best possible decisions. The best group faces challenges in limiting the impact of group think on their decision-making process. Allocations of limited resources, whether they be resources of time, energy, or finance, are ideally made after careful consideration and analysis. Part of the process of moving up in a professional management position requires increasing responsibilities for these types of decision-making processes. <clears throat> Given the challenge that we face in this Masonic fraternity in professional management expertise, it then becomes vital to establish strong controls and to develop men who possess good decision-making skills. There are several tools that a leader can employ to reduce the risk of group groupthink. First, a good leader seeks the input from the group without expressing an opinion. It's critical to pursue less vocal members of a group to seek their opinions as well. It can be helpful to ask each group members explicitly for their opinion, either in a group setting or privately afterwards. Second, at least one member of a group should be assigned to act as the quote unquote devil's advocate, especially when the consequences are significant in terms of either human or capital. It's vitally important then to this process to encourage dissent and challenges to the prevailing opinion. Third, subdivide a group into smaller independent groups working on the same problem. This subdivision allows for unique solutions to be developed. In many situations, it's important to seek external inputs and validation as well. While all organizations have to develop defenses against poor decision-making techniques, not all organizations are faced with the additional complication of inexperienced senior managers that we encounter within the Masonic fraternity. When you combine the lack of a professional experience in managing larger organizations and budgets with the symptoms that we see in groupthink, you often produce toxic results. Efforts to improve decision-making processes will likely be met with resistance. Remember, brothers, we are dealing with an illusion of invulnerability. The decline in membership over the last several decades certainly has made fertile the soil in which groupthink has taken root, and that same membership decline opens the opportunity to confront those same challenges. Smaller lodges with a focus on quality membership experience and education are potentially fertile grounds to explore all topics germane to our Masonic experience, which includes how management theory and psychology can be applied in this general craft. Ultimately, brothers, the responsibility to develop and implement good decision-making techniques lies at the local lodge and individual members. However, the teaching of basic techniques to evaluate the quality of our processes would certainly be a reasonable effort by any Grand Lodge's education program. The challenge faced by volunteer organizations such as the Masonic Fraternity, the lack of full-time professional managers with formal training, and the unique leadership selection processes that we have combined to create an unusually fertile ground for inefficient decision-making with substantial risk to the limited resources of this organization. The fraternity is replete with examples of groupthink at all levels, and our failure to address this issue only increases the risk to our reputation and treasure. There are common sense techniques that can be deployed to combat this risk, and while those efforts may meet resistance at higher levels due to the other symptoms of groupthink, much opportunity exists today to improve decisions at a local level. The beauty of our fraternity is that each lodge can serve as its own incubator of ideas within the constraints of the grand jurisdiction's rules, of course. Brothers, I hope you'll consider management theory, decision-making processes, most especially groupthink, is worthy of your educational pursuits in the future with your own lodge. How we manage our business as is as an important component of this organization as any other. So I'll open this for any comments or questions at this point. That's the sum of the paper. Of course, brother, thank you. Um, I'll try to kick it off. And if anyone has any questions or thoughts, you can uh, click to raise your virtual hand on the screen 
or you're welcome to type a question into the chat box um, and we'll go from there. So I guess my first question is why this topic? What was it that has maybe occurred or an experience in your Masonic journey recently that has triggered this topic in your mind? I come at this from kind of a unique perspective, um, having watched decisions that have been made, uh, not just personally uh, within lodges uh, or at the Grand Lodge level or district level, uh, but also in business. And I end up asking myself, why did we choose what we chose? Uh, it, it can be anything from the, the decision to locate a particular lodge in uh, this area of town compared to that area of town, uh, down to something is uh, significant is the purchase of real estate or uh, take your pick. I mean, this is a something that we studied in college uh, and really just kind of stuck with me. So I went back and started asking, why are we not applying management theory to the management of a multi-million dollar business? All right, so do you have an answer for that great question? The answer is cyclical, right? It's just group think. Uh, we have this illusion of invulnerability. It, this is the way that we've always done it. How many of you times have we heard that? And we've done this, the joke in Kentucky is we've done it this way for a thousand years. Um, I guess, let me rephrase my question. Is there a how, how rather, do we eliminate or, or cut through group think? I think the first thing is we have to be candid about it. Um, I get in trouble a lot of times for being the devil's advocate because I'm forever pushing back against what I consider to be ill-conceived ideas. Um, and if they hold up, then there's an opportunity then to maybe expose one additional corner. Our job is to ask questions. Our job is to push back. We are going to absolutely positively get uh, pressure because we dissent from the majority. Right? If you look at a situation and do not believe that it is being properly managed and you ask a question, the illusion of invulnerability of the Grand Lodge or of the master of the lodge, uh, whatever, whoever the decision-making authority rests in. Uh, that illusion of invulnerability by itself creates this need for a unanimous decision. It creates this direct pressure. And in professional settings, there's cause and effect. If you misallocate resources and it leads to a bad decision, then there are professional consequences. It may be a loss of income, it may be a loss of employment, it may be a loss of professional reputation. In Freemasonry, we don't have that same cause-effect relationship. If we make a, a bad decision on dues, uh, we refuse to raise dues, so we have the, the fundraiser, the pass the hat. Then the, the challenge becomes, why are we making this bad decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the comments in the, the chat was, why? Right? Uh, not how, but why do we believe the status quo is where we should be? Uh, and I think that simply is a, a question of we have this, again, illusion of invulnerability. This is the way it has always been. You know, we hang so much of our own uh, nostalgia on the, the fact that we are experiencing the exact same right that George Washington received, that Ben Franklin received, that Mozart received, uh, when even a casual study of ritual, for example, will tell you that there's been growth, there's been changes uh, in the last two to 300 years. Now, we have to strip away the romance of this and attack these issues. I'm not saying the, the bones of Freemasonry are bad, I'm saying the administrative behaviors in Freemasonry are ill-experienced. 
And more than anything, it's what it comes down to in my mind. The individuals who have professional experience generally uh, do not have the time to participate at a level that would help you offset some of these risks. At what point, brother, would you, is, is group think subject, you know, in definition? I'm sorry, I lost you for a second. At what, what point, point is, is at what point is it subjective of, of what group think is? I think the I think you could mischaracterize something as group think uh, because it fits your personal narrative. Sure. Okay. Um, I often try to flip the script. I call it my 180 rule. So if I'm looking at a situation and I'm absolutely positive that this is the correct solution, I flip the script 180 degrees and say, if black was white and white was black, right? if short was tall and tall was short, how would this look? Because I, I want to try to strip away my personal convictions and evaluate it from the perspective of just the facts. So when does groupthink become simply a matter of personal opinion, or uh, I think it comes down to, have you tested this question, this particular decision? And it's, it's every decision. You have to address this, this risk. Mm -hmm. There's this inherent morality of the group. Um, there's a, a lot of times a rationalization that this is the right decision kind of in hindsight. Um, Somebody just posted in the chat a great example of that, maybe the worst you know, issue. Uh, let me just finish out my year without something bad happening. Uh, we talk about this all the time. We have to get away from the cycle of my year. Mm -hmm. right? It, what other business do you know of that chooses leaders the way that we do and that plans a 12-month cycle and reinvents the wheel every November or December. To my, my knowledge, Freemasonry is the only business that elects from its membership, its board of directors, its senior leadership, and doesn't have any significant discussion in advance about what those leaders are bringing to the job. We interview people for a year and fail to even ask the first question, what are you going to do to improve the business? Yeah. A good question that was sent to me directly from uh, brother Jim Musgrave, past master. He says, I'd be interested to know your thoughts, John Sissel, on whether we can help, if whether we help create this problem by virtue of saying we are seeking harmony, peace and love in our lodges. Group think and harmony, are they, are they cousins to each other? I don't think so. Um, but but that comes down to the willingness to disagree without having animosity towards another brother. Okay. You can be absolutely positively 180 degrees on the opposite side of an issue from me. And we can still be friendly. But the, the challenge here is being willing to address the situation as it stands, you know, the, the structure of the question without being exposed enough to have my feelings hurt. Sure. Okay. It, so we say who can best work and best agree, uh, but we are uh, allegedly an enlightenment era thinking group and our job is to be able to think and to critically analyze a question and to be able to cast off a good idea for a better idea yep. right? and and that is not incongruent with being harmonious in that work because we should be all willing to expose ourselves to ideas that we had not considered previously. I agree. 
Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, I know you said that you have a question for John. Would you like to go ahead? Yeah, John, you uh, mentioned and you referred to uh, the idea that lodges should be the incubator of ideas. And you've answered some of the uh, areas as to why they're not. What are your suggestions on how to get lodges to be incubators of ideas? Well, um, if I had that answer, I'd be an author and make a lot of money. <laughs> no, how do you encourage lodges to be incubators of ideas? I think there's actually a role here for the Grand Lodge. Um, yep. You know, I personally have some concerns with uh, some of the sacred cows. Okay. One example is uh, plural memberships. And I, I think we have over sown the seed of plural memberships, at least in our jurisdiction. Um, so you have so much cross-pollination in, in lodges that you don't have the opportunity to have unique experiences. And it, there's always been, not always, there has been a one size fits all approach to Freemasonry really since you know, kind of the World War II era. You go back before that, uh, we had lodges here locally uh, that spoke English and other lodges that you know, met and spoke in German. And uh, we had lodges that were uh, almost exclusively uh, members were Jewish. And we had lodges. So each one of these lodges had their own personalities. Um, and while there's still some of that, I think there is a, a general push for some homogenous experience because it's what people think is what, is what worked. Um, it clearly hasn't worked. You know, the, the statistics, the membership statistics bear out that we have been trying to do the same thing for the last six decades and, and we've not turned the corner yet. And ultimately, I think it's going to be the lodges who are willing to take a risk and provide a different experience that are going to survive and potentially in the long game thrive in this market. I mean, at the end of the day, this is simply a market of ideas. And if one lodge presents the ideas in a better presentation, better packaging uh, and higher quality, then that's, that should over a long enough period of time result in them having a better rate of return than the lodge that is presenting the eat meat and hit the street philosophy. Well, on a scale of one to 10, uh, your experience, where would you rank progressive lines as part of the reason there is not incubation of ideas in many lodges? Well, um, yeah, John, personally, you know, my opinions on progressive lines, I think that they are absolutely a terrible experience in practical application. I have no problem at all training a steward to be a deacon or a deacon to be a warden, uh, but I don't believe that you should elect an individual on the night that he is, he gives his proficiency back as a master mason and elect him to be the, the junior steward because that chair happens to be empty and just assume that seven years from now, he's going to be the master of your lodge. Uh, he may not have the skill set to do that. And I go back to the, the opening question that I ask, you know, would you rather your treasurer be managed by a CPA or a delivery driver? Uh, I, I know how I would prefer my treasury to be managed and it would be the same thing if we are uh, talking about, would I rather have someone who manages a, a significant business operation uh, helping to make decisions for my lodge or would I rather have him cooking the meal? Thank you, brother. Yeah, Travis West had the same comment about the progressive line. Um, well said. We have a couple hands up. Um, Piercy Jantz, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yes, thank you. A question. Would you consider, would you advocate a requirement for a basic management skills course for people moving into positions of responsibility in Grand Line? Not repeatedly, but at least once to get exposed to some of the issues that you have raised. 
Christy, I would tell you that if I had uh, the magic pixie dust that could do that, absolutely. Uh, I, I would want individuals, I would like to see a professional management structure. Now, whether that is uh, more of a, in terms of an executive director who, who's hired and uh, works on payroll for Grand Lodge, uh, or whether that is someone who has a professional experience, you know, takes some level of course. The question is, where do we get that education? Uh, do we want to send them to, uh, to Wharton, or do we want to send them to the local university to get an MBA? Or do we, because so much of what we do is kind of build your own. Um, it's real hard to build your own if you don't have internally the skill set. And we go back to that illusion of invulnerability uh, simply because somebody travels and, and makes all of these meetings. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily qualified to be elected. But if you've got 300 lodges in your jurisdiction, each with a vote, you're going to have to overcome that bias first to get that legislation enacted. Um, I think that the better solution is to create those incubators in the local lodge, teach those members in a local lodge, share that information amongst lodges who are interested in developing better leadership. You know, the long game here and the long game may be 20 years from now and it may be 30 years from now, but the long game here is there is a reckoning coming. You know, if you follow the math and eventually some of these problems are going to die out because there is you know, this continued decline in membership and people who are unwilling to face that unfortunately get elected more often than the people who are willing to say that. It sounds like you would be in favor of doing something like that, but bring it in on the, uh, on the lodge level rather than the Grand Lodge level, start it at the grassroots. I, I think that any lodge that is serious about improving their leadership would do well to establish some basic um, education for potential wardens, um, you know, is a kind of a starting point. Um, and it can be something as simple as grabbing some management books, um, something maybe as simple as strength finders. Uh, you don't have to, to go out and go completely off the deep end here. But if you can learn some basic management techniques, if you don't have an MBA, if you don't have a a business degree, it's okay. Uh, it, there's more of those members in, in lodges than, than there's not, but you should still understand some basic management theory so that you can then apply that to the management of your lodge. Something as simple as budgeting. Uh, how many lodges do you know of that just operate based on whatever's in the checkbook is what can we can pay? You know, every lodge ought to have a budget and it should be a realistic budget. We have X number of dollars coming in, Y number of dollars going out. If X is less than Y, then that's the first lesson in management. We have to figure out how to increase X or decrease Y. Eventually that will trickle up you know, to the Grand Lodge level because you're going to have better performance or should have better performance out of better run lodges. I suspect that giving your lecture or a version of your lecture as an educational piece in our lodge, just to the people that are present would probably have some impact and get people thinking about the way they react in meetings. So it's a good takeaway. Good, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Brother Piercy. I, personally, this is just a comment. I think the ultimate failure is of the Grand Lodge. Um, I mean, individual lodge is great. They can do what they can do, but I think ultimately the Grand Lodge is is failing our lodges to some extent, to a large extent, frankly. And then we're a volunteer organization. That's that's a big issue right there is we're volunteers. We all have family, children, spouses, lives. Um, in any event, Brother Bruce, you have your hand raised. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I would fully agree with everything that 
Brother John has said, and uh, the one tool that I would throw out is that uh, one of the gentlemen that I've been reading quite a few of his books is John Maxwell, who is quite a motivational speaker in my opinion. And uh, the title of the book that I'm reading currently, which is right on track with what you're talking about, is called Thinking for a Change. And in that, uh, what I wrote before was part of what he says, but uh, on uh, page 169, he says, uh, question the status quo. Most people want their lives to keep improving, yet they value peace and stability at the same time. People often forget you can't improve and still stay the same. Growth means change. Change requires challenging the status quo. If you want greater possibilities, you can't settle for what you have now. And I think the problem is that most people don't want to change. They value the status quo too much. And uh, I wish I'd have been at a meeting of my own lodge because I got our newsletter and they have something that I imagine was not in the budget but they're going to pay for something uh, just because I think the lodge said, hey, what a great idea. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, let, we'll do that. And uh, I think at the next time I'm there, I'm gonna say one, was it in the budget? Secondly, why are we doing this when it only benefits a small group of our members? So thank you again for letting me talk, brethren. I appreciate, and I do appreciate being part of this group. Thank you, Brother Bruce. Appreciate your comments. Uh, David Felty. Greetings, brothers. Um, I'd like to pick up that role that uh, our speaker mentioned of the devil's advocate, or I would say more correctly, the loyal opposition. And my question basically is in the chat. I'll correct the spelling and elaborate upon it a little bit. Much is said these days about whether or not it is good for our country, our society, including our lodges, to be governed and ruled by technocrats, ruled by experts. Sounds like that is what is being suggested by our speaker this evening. And then comes the next step, which is called certification and education and schooling and societies and organizations to certify the credential, credentialing and then bureaucracy, and then eventually there is what you might call the rebellion of the common man against technocracy and expertise, which is where I believe our society is at this exact moment. Sounds like you're an advocate of technology, but I don't see anywhere mentioned what you do when technocracy and expertise go sour, when it becomes the way we've always done things and is assumed and uh, assumed to always be right and group think of managerial styles comes into play. Why, where is the, uh, the, the loyal opposition uh, devil's advocate says, where's the corrective when this goes wrong? Because I see it go wrong. And I would say probably the most leader skilled Florida Freemason I know is someone who for all practical purposes is illiterate. Maybe among other reasons, that's why he's so good at, at memorizing his parts but at least that it's a counter example. And thank you for letting me contribute. No, absolutely. Appreciate the, it, I'm so glad that somebody wanted to challenge this right? because the, the illusion of invulnerability that you get by being the picture on the screen and the presenter um, is oftentimes the first illusion of invulnerability that we have to overcome. Uh, anytime somebody, challenges a presenter, um, it forces the presenter, I think, and ultimately the group to consider a different angle. Uh, more specifically in response to your question, uh, David, I don't necessarily believe that the lodge should be ruled or governed by quote unquote experts. Um, I think that we have lost, unfortunately, um, a, a necessary component of our membership over the last six decades. And that portion of the membership is the individuals who brought a particular skill set to the table. Um, whether that is the 
you know, local bank president, uh, whether that is the local mayor, whether that is the, the individual who runs the factory. Um, we have a whole lot of Indians and not a whole lot of chiefs. Okay, now that may be politically incorrect, uh, but the point is we've got a whole lot of folks who are willing to, to strap on the gear and go play, but very few coaches in today's world in, in Freemasonry. Um, and the coaches or the chiefs that are involved in this organization oftentimes are otherwise engaged in raising funds for their local shrine charity or working with their Scottish Rite, or uh, maybe they carry a dues card, but they're not terribly active in their local lodge because, hey, they're, they are the bank president. Um, those individuals, those leaders, even if they are not actively engaged in the day-to-day, -day, would absolutely be great resources to bounce ideas off of, to work through. Um, one of the best business lessons I, I ever got. I was 20 years old working in a locally owned retail store. And the guy who owned the business said to me, I know what I do well. And those things that I don't do well, I know to hire people who do. And that's one of the first lessons we try to teach any new initiate into this, this order. It's know yourself. Now, if you know where your strengths are and you can identify your weaknesses and more importantly, have someone who candidly will say to you, this is a soft spot for you, then you can hopefully round that out by having someone who is stronger in that space. I don't think that makes us a technocracy, but I certainly think it gives us a broader base from which to draw. Does that, that make sense? David, you want to respond? Maybe not. Hey, I want to grab on one thing that's here in the chat too from Randy Sanders. Uh, I absolutely agree with you, Randy. One of the obstacles that we see is the difference between managing a company based on profits versus managing a service-oriented nonprofit um, is the lack of employees, uh, you know, or more particularly those who vote with their feet. Uh, I, I hear that often. Uh, that one of the biggest challenges that we have managing is being able to manage. Uh, a group of volunteers. And that comes back to the point I was making earlier that we have to first be a strong enough relationship with the people that are around us to be able to challenge the idea without demeaning uh, the person who presents the idea. Now, groupthink uh, inherently has this rationalization and will stereotype the group that is not part of the, the collective, uh, puts pressure on dissenters and has these self-appointed mind guards you know, who, uh, who run around basically fighting these ideas. So, so much of this has to do with, with trying to build relationships in your local lodge. And that really goes back to a comment that was made in the presentation as well. The exponential growth of our membership in our individual lodges um, is one of the roots of this problem. And we're holding on to, in a lot of lodges, the idea that, you know, in 1975, we had 300 members and today we've only got 100. You know, what's wrong with us? And I would tell you that maybe that's more a perspective of what's right with us. We're getting smaller individually so we can have stronger relationships with the people who are in our lodge and creates a higher level of, of comfort when someone challenges you. Um, you. Realize it may not be an assault on your personal integrity more than it is an assault on an idea that may need some, you know, some help. Yeah, John, this is an excellent topic, one that could certainly go on in discussion for a long time. I mean, there's so many variables to making this right. I mean, it's it's infinite. I mean, we we can hardly agree on some of the landmarks of our fraternity. fraternity. 
when and so how are we going to how are we going to agree on what those common key performance indicators are that we all should be able to agree upon as far as what's what are good numbers and what are bad numbers and how do we get there and etc this this is a this is a really good topic with a lot of difficult questions and answers because there's so many possibilities i believe that will lead to the ultimate outcome of utopia so to speak which doesn't exist uh, brother Darren, you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, worshipful brother Brian, thank you. I guess I'll lower my hand now. <clears throat> worshipful brother John, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, sir. Fantastic. I left the video off. I apologize. I had a, a late and long session at the gym, and I look like an idiot. So, so I'd rather be not viewed by the public here today. But, but enjoyed the talk a lot. And as an economist, there's a gazillion things we could talk about here. And uh, well, one thing that I think is interesting, there are two comments I'd like to make. Uh, first, the idea of groupthink. Well, it, and you've kind of, you kind of touched on this in a roundabout way, but it, you know, it's, it's not surprising that in any organization, much less Freemasonry, that you, you see this develop. You know, people in groups, they don't want to do stuff. They want to be free riders, as we say. And so it's real easy to sort of get lulled into a groupthink. You don't have to do anything problematic of course but that's hard to crack through but one thing you spoke recently which has made me um, raise my hand is i've got this excellent book here called misbehaving by a nobel economist uh, richard taller and it's all about sort of the evolution of behavioral economics in which he was a pioneer of and there was one section that reminded me a lot and i think this is why we see a lot of reluctance in, in lodges to uh well let's not buck the system too much we've always done it this way and he, he brings up this this concept which is a very incredibly powerful tool in behavioral economics called uh, a loss aversion what we mean by this is that a loss hurts more than an equivalent gain gives pleasure so it's a really odd way of thinking about things so i'm going to read from him here he says you know we feel diminishing sensitivity to both gains and losses and losses sting more than equivalently sized gains feel good so that's kind of a weird conception. I think that's exactly why we tend to sometimes get stuck in this rut of, well, this is how we've always done it. So, uh, if you try something new and it fails, that loss stings a lot more than the little gain you would get by not doing it. And so I think there's some, some weird uh, results we get in our, um, you know, just in the group setting that we have here. And I wish I had the answers on how to solve these things. Maybe I'd write a book just like you know, Professor Taller here, but uh, but anyway, I, I did want to chime in on that because there there are uh, some real interesting behavioral economics things that, I mean, if this guy sat in the lodge room, he could write a whole nother volume to this book, I would think. So that's all I had to say. Darren, I appreciate your particular uh, viewpoint as an econ economist because there's there's so much more that comes from this everything from the opportunity cost of what we're wasting uh, you know to uh, well there's there's so much more that we could go into that you probably could could expand on for us uh, in terms of the economic loss that, that we encounter as a result of poor decision making so I really appreciate you weighing in there because you're absolutely right Sometimes it's a whole lot easier to make a, uh, a poor decision because it's not painful than it is to make what should be a good decision. But if the risk reward ratio is not properly aligned, you, know, you end up in a situation where a, a good decision that happens to have a poor outcome short term uh, has a significant penalty associated with it. And if we live in this 12 month cycle, then we punish the master who may have made long-term the right decision. Uh, brothers, for the sake of time, we're going to move on in a moment. We have one more question um, from worship brother Dan Kimball, unless there are any other pressing questions or comments on this matter before we proceed. So worship brother Kimball, floor is yours. Worshipful Brother uh, Cecil, thank you for your presentation, and uh, thank you for coming up on uh, what may be the shortest notice I've ever seen. Uh, 
Um, um, there's a topic that I want to touch on. I want to take you actually back to the concept of groupthink. And uh, uh, Brother Randy Sanders has uh, mentioned twice in the chat box uh, the term critical thinking. Uh, if you happen to be, and, and I invite Brother Randy, by the way, to chime in on this, uh, but I'd like to hear your perspectives about this. If you happen to be the critical thinker in your lodge, that can be an awfully lonely place at times. Um, so how do you address that if, if you find yourself in that position? You're asking that question to me, Dan? I'm asking it for both of you or for anyone else who wants to respond to that. Is worshipful, John, go ahead. Well, Dan, you know me personally, I sometimes almost enjoy the um, roughing it up a little bit, if you will, uh, in, in a situation. I have absolutely no fear at all of, of challenging the status quo. Uh, it, it gets me in trouble. You know, I, I, I get a lot of pushback. Uh, but you're right. It, there is a lonely spot to be had uh, if you're the, the only critical thinker. Uh, the solution to that is to cultivate uh, strong relationships with people who are not necessarily inside the four walls of your lodge, uh, but who you can look to for input, advice. Uh, there's always a deeper well out there to go to, uh, whether that is you know, someone in your lodge, someone that you respect, uh, maybe it's someone across town or across the state or in another part of the country. Um, we have to be a resource for each other uh, to to come back to, to recharge, to, to get feedback. Because if you are the lone island um, out there, it is, it's lonely, it's cold, it's dark, um, and you're really fighting a, a losing battle. Um, connecting with groups like this, for me, really does help recharge that. Uh, it, it allows me to see that there are other people who, who are looking at Freemasonry uh, as something more than a supper club. Uh, and, and that allows me to continue uh, the work to improve my lodge and, and the local lodge experience. Now, Brother Randy, you wanna make a comment on that topic? I do, thank you. Um, I, I totally agree with what uh, Brother John just said. And and the uh, may, maybe I can add a little bit of a corollary to that, actually. When we find ourselves alone in a lodge room, what that's mean is the other brothers have focused on an idea or developed an idea that we may not agree with. And from a critical thinking perspective, let me go two different directions on this. First, for my own um, refreshment, my own um, uh, way of, of kind of recharging myself. Uh, I'm, I'm very much into the contemplative practices. I, I'll go meditate. You know, we're, we're told uh, um, the uh, uh, pot of incense is uh, one of our uh, symbols and one of our items that we're told about in the Entered Apprentice uh, lecture. Why not use it? Why, why was that brought out? I think there's a good reason for that. So the contemplative practice is how I particularly recharge. That's a, that's a, a suggestion, um, not necessarily the only way to do it. Finding other people that are of critical thinking nature that, that challenge you on your uh, thoughts is also a very good way of doing that. When I'm in lodge and I find myself in that position with others that disagree with my direction, I like to use questions. I like to ask why, not to put people on the spot. Why is a very pointed question, but why uh, does a situation exist? That is not such so pointed, but it, it brings the thought process out and tries to bring more considered contemplative thought there. Why are we losing, you know, X number of members per year? Well, there's two answers to that. We're not bringing any in and our population 
like me, is aging. All right. Okay. Why is that? The five whys, if anybody's heard of that book or, or that uh, um, uh, motivational talk, is a great way to get to the root of anything. You ask why five times, by the time you've answered the fifth iteration of that why, yeah, you're probably at the root cause of the issues. Why is this a bad thing? I heard that a couple of times. That was a very excellent question. Why is it a good thing? But if you bring these questions to the members of the lodge in a non-threatening and non-pointed manner, <laughs> it can be tough for me, but if we do it in a non-threatening and a non-affrontive manner, um, that is that is exactly what we're meant to be doing with each other. My, my, my own opinion here, what we're meant to be doing with each other, even a, a um, more experienced, more learned brother who is very set on a certain direction, I've found that if I can kind of part that veil by saying things like, if we do this and this happens, then where does that lead us? and let them come to the same conclusions that I've drawn, maybe that's a, a more kinder, gentler way of, of uh, guiding uh, some of these more recalcitrant is the actual word for it, brothers. They're, they're kind of stuck there. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe opening that veil a little bit, letting them take that step, if they're willing to, is the way to do it. And I thank you for your time, thanks. Yeah, I, I would point, I would follow up with you there. I, I love the five whys. Um, another one that I stumbled across reading uh, a book by Dan Harinko was the Socrates Cafe. If you've not read the Socrates Cafe, find a copy of it. Um, it really does help you teach, if you will, a, a Socratic discussion, uh, which if you can employ that technique regularly in your lodge, um, then it allows you to challenge a question or an assumption um, and do so in a non-threatening manner. Uh, it, it, that's a it's a fabulous book, and it's something that one of our past masters uh, employed when he was master of lodge. It was a goal to have these Socratic discussions on a regular basis. And it certainly does engage other members and take that and apply the concerns about groupthink. Uh, and I think it opens doors. Brothers, in the chat is my email address. If you will send me an email, I will send you a PDF copy of this. Um, it is formatted uh, for, for my use uh, to deliver as a presentation. Uh, so it's not terribly pretty, but if you'll give me a day or two, I'll get it cleaned up so it's a little cleaner presentation. Uh, and I believe that Brother Kimball had uh, asked for a copy of this for the transactions as well. Worship Brother John says, so thank you for stepping in today um, and filling a gap that we had to overcome at such short notice. And uh, just so everyone knows, he has no fear to, uh, because uh, John Cecil has no fear because he's 6'4". So that helps too. Just so you know, um, drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> John, thank you. Really, my pleasure, bro. Great, Absolutely, great presentation, <clears throat> brothers. We're going to move on. And as most of you are aware, we recently lost one of the greatest Freemasons of probably our time, right? Worship Brother Thomas W. Jackson. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak has prepared some words to share with you about the impact this brother has had on our craft. And then following his statement, we're going to take a brief moment to pause and reflect on the life of this great man while listening to a song that has been sung by a worship brother, Andrew Hammer. So with that being said, worship brother Bizak, the floor is yours. Thank you, brother. Illustrious Thomas W. Jackson passed away in the final days of December 2021. Tom was known throughout the entire Masonic world, not just in the United States. In his younger days, he taught biology for about 17 years. He was a manager of a construction company and served as a deputy sheriff. 
He served 20 years as the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and as the Executive Secretary and Honorary President of the World Conference on Freemasonry. He was one of the most well-traveled Masons of this or any other century and a very powerful advocate for the high standards throughout Freemasonry. His international travels are legendary along with his uh, reputation as a fisherman and a big game hunter in faraway lands. It would require much more time than a lot of this evening to list all the organizations, titles, commendations, medals of merit, and Masonic messages that Tom delivered in his lifetime. But information about Tom will always be available from many good sources for future generations of Masons. And one of the most common themes in Tom's countless speeches and writings was to decry the lowering of standards and quality poor understanding and execution of ritual in lodges and the gradual loss of this prestigious reputation that was once so common throughout North American masonry. Tom believed masonry here in America lost its way when it stopped attracting the very sort of men and community leaders who used to act as mentors and examples of our wider membership. He was always a firm believer that elitism is not a bad word. And he consistently encouraged lodges and masons to demand higher standards of themselves because, as he would say, you can't make good men better if you don't have the best men to admire, emulate, and learn today. Tom once said, you can't make fine porcelain out of mediocre clay. Tom was survived by his wife, Linda. They lived on their farm in Shippenburg, Pennsylvania and married for 56 years, so please keep her in your prayers. I'd grown to know Tom well over the past several years, and we spoke often, and the last time I did talk with him was when he was in the hospital a couple of days before he passed. He sounded quite weak, but he wanted to chat, as he always did, and we did. And at the end of our brief conversation, he told me that what was giving him hope and optimism was all the correspondence and well wishes that he'd received from around the world from Masons and public dignitaries who had heard of his recent reemergence of cancer and his current battle against a very severe case of COVID. He asked me to give his warm fraternal regards to Lexington Lodge number one, the Rubicon Masonic Society of which he is an honorary member, the friends he made here in Lexington during his visits and all who attended and watch our virtual education series, a series he was very proud to point out often that out of the 30 held over two years, he missed only a handful. So brethren, I close the remarks tonight by passing on Tom's request by extending to each of you this evening, a warm and fraternal regard for all brothers from Thomas W. Jackson. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Brethren of the cross. Every rung goes higher
<clears throat> At this time, if anybody would like to say a brief word or two about Right Worship Brother Thomas Jackson, you're more than welcome to do so now. And of course, there is no obligation to do so. I just wanted to open up the floor in case anyone did wish, wish to say something. He was a good man, he'll be missed. Brothers and friends, are there any other final comments from any of our attendees or members of William O. Ware, Rubicon, Lexington Lodge One before we proceed to close this evening? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Worship Brother Bizak, Kimball, any final thoughts or comments before we leave? Just a thank you to Worship Brother Cecil again for stepping up this evening. Excellent discussion, John. A very good topic that needs to be discussed in many lodges and in depth. Thank you. Thank you. Worship Brother Dan. Like a Worship Brother Bizak's remarks, uh, uh, Another fine evening among good men. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you, brother. Uh, brothers, if you're not already aware, uh, Rubicon Masonic Society is now a 501c3 charitable organization. Um, any donations made to Rubicon are 100% tax deductible. I want to thank any of those uh, brothers and individuals who have personally donated and for everyone who supports our passion for Masonic education. Uh, if you have an interest in learning more about uh, Rubicon education and would like to make a donation, you're always welcome to do so. There's no limits of any kind, um, small or large. You can send a check to Worship Brother Dan Kimball. His address is on the screen. And any proceeds go strictly to the pursuit and furtherment of uh, Masonic education. Worship Brother Dan Kimball, would you please deliver a closing devotion this evening? There's again, our benediction is taken from the ritual of the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin. Guide us, O Lord, to ever walk toward your light, that our shadows might ever lie behind us. Let us perceive our blessings, that we may ever serve you with a happy heart and a quiet mind. Almighty and eternal God, teach us to know that your love is eternal, that through you, life is eternal that with you there is no horizon, for horizons are nothing but a limit of sight, and with your leading, we can see clearly. Grant us the grace to see the task that you would have us perform, the courage to proceed, and in our doing, let us reflect your love and peace, Almighty God, whose spirit is known in the hearts of the thankful, and who makes good cheer the companion of strength. Amen. Thank you, brother. I want to thank everyone for joining us. If you know of any others that may be interested in this virtual Masonic education, please invite them to RSVP at RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash RSVP. Please keep all sick and distressed in your prayers and always trust in God with all your heart. We will be closing out with the official trailer from the Masonic table, the, the Masonic table, in case you didn't catch that one, uh, which will be uh, airing and streaming uh, April uh, 2022. Enjoy. Throughout the world, formal Masonic dining is as commonplace as the square and compass. And it always has been. However, in the US, the practice has fallen away so noticeably that almost every document that has referred to it in the past hundred years laments the fact that it's fallen into a state of disuse. Some lodges may follow very traditional forms of toasts, salutes and songs where other lodges may have a more simpler protocol, one that has a more natural and spontaneous feel. Regardless of how a lodge goes about crafting a dining experience, 
Any lodge that does so brings this important component of Masonic Fellowship back to life within its walls. And by so doing, more enthusiastically install that noblest of Masonic aspirations into the practice of our craft. Brethren, good night. Thank you for joining us. Be well. We'll see you next month.